Thank you, everybody, for uh, joining me. Time is one of the precious gifts that we give to each other, so I really appreciate that. I knew from an early age that time, what it is and how we experience it, was one of life's greatest riddles. As a kid, I loved stories about time machines. Questions like these posed by Dr. Zeus intrigued me. How did it get so late so soon? It's night before it's afternoon. December is here before it's June. My goodness, how the time has flown. How did it get so late so soon? 60 years later, this rhyming, inspiring, inquiring seems even more appropriate thanks to the chronological mischief caused by the pandemic. According to psychologist Cynthia Baumbaker, this tiny virus has made us particularly vulnerable to temporal disintegration. Our framework of time has been radically disrupted. Baumbaker says that we are living in a liminal space, an anxious time of transition in which the lives we once knew have changed and we don't know exactly what they will look like when the pandemic is over. A Dr. Ruth Odgen, a lead researcher into COVID's effect on our sense of time, wrote that early in the pandemic, she thought that temporal disintegration would affect us all pretty similarly. But her research actually showed that 20% of the participants experienced time as normal during lockdown, 40% experienced it as slower than normal, and 40% experienced it faster than normal. So it's clear that people have very different experiences of time during COVID. The pandemic has already made us feel off balance and isolated. So I'm not gonna to add to any of that by claiming that there's some right or wrong way to experience time during lockdown. Some of us are experiencing contradictory things. I mean, sometimes I feel that the clock is hardly moving and other times the calendar pages are flipping by. Some of you may feel fine about time and others struggle and all that's normal. One psychologist put it this way, he said, people should feel licensed to feel uncomfortable. So my plan for today is I'm gonna begin by sharing some of the diverse ways we're experiencing time. Then I'll touch on some superficial and incomplete thoughts about how physics denies the existence of objective time. I'll move on to the pandemic effect on some existential issues about time. And then I'll conclude with some advice about managing COVID's disruption of our calendar and our clock. Now, for many of us, pandemic stress has taken away the sense of predictability. It's all, as people are saying constantly, unprecedented. Scientific American Nicole Westman wrote that stress robbed us of a conception of the future when jobs are unstable and school schedules are up in the air and rules regularly shift, it's hard to envision what might happen next. Baum Baker says, we no longer have our illusory assumptions that the future is knowable and predictable. This radical change to our routines is difficult to process. We begin to experience disassociation, which Baum Baker describes as a feeling of being here and not being here simultaneously. She says it's like an electrical system that gets overheated when overloaded and just shuts off as a protective reaction. We check out because it's too overwhelming to check in. University of California researcher Allison Holman says, when you mess with a person's sense of time and just chop off a future, you've disrupted the whole balance. So we can feel an uneasiness about the cadence of the clock. Dr. Ogden adds that the loss of these rhythms means that we're almost lost in time because we don't have our usual cues as to what day it is or even what time of the day it is. So it's no wonder that we're challenged when Discover Magazine Leslie Nemo asks, quick, without looking at a calendar, what day is it? Nemo says that we felt our days ooze into one another, blending together into an amorphous mass. It's like we've fallen into the film Groundhog Day where we wake up every morning on the same date, like the calendar stuck on February 2nd. It makes us feel like the present is isolated from the continuity of time. 
This isolation from time itself, combined with social isolation, can make us feel depressed. And depression can slow time even more. Add to that mix impatience and our watched pot never boils. Annette Shermer, a brain researcher, says that how we perceive time depends on where we place the focus of our attention. If we place it on time, time passes more slowly. And this can lead into a spiral of distress. The fear of the pandemic can accelerate rate this downward spiral because when anxiety rises, when we're afraid, we begin to feel differently about time. Baum Baker says that when exposed to threatening stimuli, people increase their time estimates. So when we're threatened by violence, for example, we overestimate how long we're in danger. Ogden says that when we experience fear, we experience a sensation of time passing more slowly than normal. She thinks that this is linked to our sympathetic nervous system, which activates flight or fight responses and can make us feel like we're moving in slow motion. I mean, when people are in the midst of a traumatic experience, time does seem to slow down or even stop. People often will describe a car accident like it all seemed like it was in slow motion. The car cut in front of them, they slam on the brake, and then it seems like forever before that horrible crunching sound punctuates the end of this skid. Suddenly the motion, uh, uh, the, this boost of adrenaline can shift consciousness into slow motion. And I experienced this more positively when I played competitive sports years ago, a long time ago. As a goalie in lacrosse, I'd focus intensely on the ball as it was passed from one opposing player to the other, getting closer and closer to the goal that I was defending. And this increased sense of threat raised adrenaline in my body. But at the same time, I was able to tap into a parasympathetic resources, which allowed me to maintain a sense of calm in the midst of this acute focus and readiness. And the ball would seem to slow down and I played my best. That's what many athletes call being in the zone. It's intense and it's effective. Being in the zone isn't just about one sense. It's not just about seeing the ball or feeling the stick or moving through space. It's a holistic experience. Baum Baker says that time is a unique sense that may contribute to time's distortion powerful effect. Unlike hearing or seeing or tasting, the sense of time is not mediated by a specific sense organ, but rather is embodied in a more all-encompassing way. It's been shown to be encoded in the body's signals covered by the insula, a fragment of the cerebral cortex folded deep within each lobe of the brain. So time sense fully embraces us because it's lived throughout the brain. Now, if our subjective experience of time is lived throughout the brain and each of us has unique experiences of it, what can we say about time itself, about the objective nature of time, independent of human experience? Is there objective universal time? Now, those of you expecting an up-to-date explanation of the physics around time will be disappointed because I'm not a physicist. I'll give it my best shot. I may confuse more than enlighten, forgive me. I don't think it'll ruin the rest of my talk. So I'm gonna start with Albert Einstein, who when I studied him years ago, used the term objective time, but, and said basically it doesn't exist because for him, time is never absolute or objective. It's always relative to the frame of reference of the observer. Way back in 1887, researchers Mickelson and Morley conducted experiments that led them to conclude that unlike everything else in the universe, light couldn't be sped up or slowed down. There are compl complications around how light travels in water and so on. But for my purposes today, I just wanna say that Mickelson and Morley established that the speed of light is constant. Given that, Einstein asked us to imagine a railway car equipped with doors that opened when triggered by a beam of light. Place a light bulb at the center of the car equidistance from both doors. And when the bulb 
briefly flashes in the middle of the car, the beam travels to both doors, strikes the sensors at the same time, and both doors open at the same time. This makes sense, but only for a person standing in the car under the light bulb. Einstein said, imagine another observer, not in the train, but on an embankment next to the railroad tracks. When the bulb is flashed, the light beam begins traveling forwards and backwards towards the doors. For the person on the bank, however, the front door of the car is moving away from the beam of light while the rear door is speeding towards the beam of light. As a result, the distance of the two beams have to travel is different. For the person on the bank, the rear door is rushing towards the beam of light, so it opens before the front door rushing away from the beam of light. The same event, the openings of the two doors occur simultaneously for the person in the car, but at different times for the person on the embankment. Time is relative to the observer. And this leads to all sorts of bizarre riddles and space-time continuums that I don't have the time or the expertise to explore. And I didn't bring up Einstein to explain why we experience time differently during the pandemic. Because I think Einstein was making a more fundamental point. He's in effect concluding that there's no distinction between time and time as we experience it. Because there's no such thing as time independent of an observer. Now Einstein's revolution of thought blows up a lot of preconceived notions about time that was brought to us by Sir Isaac Newton three centuries ago. Newton's approach to time adequately explained our everyday experience. He maintained that time is absolute. It moves forward at a steady rate and there's nothing human beings can do about it. And that we're inside of a consistent world that is predictable and measured. Most of us using technology can agree on the time of the day and units of duration of that pace our interactions. I pay a lot of attention to this predictable set of conventions. It's part of the reasons why I think I'm particularly punctual. The Newtonian perspective fits my personality. Now, my wife Maureen, however, is not so enamored by strict predictability of Newtonian time. And here's where I'm definitely moving out of physics and into common experiences of time. Maureen has a relationship of, with time that's very different than mine. While time for me is precise, for Maureen, it's fluid. In fact, she has a wristwatch that epitomizes her experience. It has a big hand and a little hand, but instead of numbers around the rim, it has only a single word in the middle of the face, and that word is approximately. Perhaps she ex inherited this sense of time from her Latin American ancestors. Some of you have heard the expression Hispanic time. For those of you who may not have visited Latin America, if you do go, let me give you advice. If you're invited to dinner at 7 p.m., show up, I don't know, 8 o'clock. You might be a little early, but you won't be embarrassingly early. In many Latino cultures, time is fluid, expandable, more of a, a general guide than a precise measurement. These days, how this plays out in my experience is say Maureen and I plan to go for a walk through the neighborhood. I'll say, let's leave in 10 minutes. I'll get my mask in hand and walking shoes on and I'll be on the porch in 10 minutes. And early in our relationship, I'd be sitting there waiting and I might get frustrated, but now I'm usually prepared to fill the time until Maureen's ready to go. Now, what, what interests me about this example is not that Maureen is, is late, according to my clock. What fascinates me is that she's often unaware of the duration between my saying, let's leave in 10 minutes and when we actually leave. The other four folks in my home have currently learned to distinguish time on the clock from Maureen time. It, it makes me think of two approaches to time that I read about, monochronic and polychronic. I'm a monochronic type of person for whom time is predictable and regular and for whom staying on schedule is important. My Google calendar rules my day. For Maureen, precise time 
and sticking to schedules are less important than the quality of the experience, particularly the social experience. For her, there are different times, polychronic. Time for walking and time for talking to neighbors. It's like those two times are on different clocks. So when we go out for a walk, I might anticipate returning at a set time in order to get back to work. And should we happen upon a friend in the neighborhood, we'll pause for conversation. And it used to be that I'd get anxious because I'd be thinking we're going to be late in getting back or we won't get our three miles in or whatever. Whereas more recently, I understand that Maureen, for her, a precise schedule pales in comparison to social connection. For her, people matter more than minutes. There are different times for her. Now, we've learned to appreciate our differences better and how our subjective differences are valuable each in their own way. And this mutual understanding has strengthened our relationship and has helped me better process the distorting effects of time during this pandemic. I think it's helped me grow more flexible and resilient and adaptable. So with that, I wanna to turn to exploring some personal musings about the existential thinking about time in our lives. So I'm gonna start here with saying that I'm gonna to touch on three themes, the limits of our time in our lives, our time together, and the idea of time to act. I'm gonna start with the most existentially challenging, the limits of our time. While some people believe that our soul will exist forever in some afterlife, I carry an awareness that at some point my time will run out. Like they say in the longest running soap opera ever, like sands in the hourglass, so are the days of our lives. This obvious but profound insight has helped days of our lives stay on the air since 1965. That's a long time. I don't watch that soap opera, but this insight infuses my humanism. When the pandemic hit, time-related existential questions swelled up in me. Early waves of apocalyptic anxiety sparked by the threat of COVID led me to wonder, is this the beginning of the end? Do I need to get my affairs in order? Is this what happens when the grim reaper appears in our life? Do we worry about having time to say goodbye or express all that we want to before it's too late? But as the pandemic normalized, my early reaction seemed a little melodramatic, but we really didn't know what was going on back then. I mean, last March when I was going through a Target store searching for toilet paper and antiseptic wipes, I felt that every man for himself panic. When I walked through my des deserted neighborhoods, it reminded me of films like The Last Man on Earth, a 1964 classic with Vincent Price, or Will Smith in I Am Le Legend. On my empty streets, I identified with Smith's character, Dr. Robert Neville, the last surviving human confronting the meaning of solitary post-apocalyptic life. Though I didn't have to deal with zombies. Though the pandemic now seems like the new normal, just part of our life, it still reminds me that our time is limited. It still magnifies the precious nature of existence. In a way, it does for me what staring up at the stars on a clear night does. It sets my everyday temporal troubles into a larger context. It reminds me not to sweat the small stuff. In the chronologically playful novel, The Time Machine by H.G. Wells, he writes, quote, looking at the stars suddenly dwarf my own troubles and all the gravities of terrestrial life I thought of their unfathomable distance and the slow inevitable drift of their movements out of the unknown past into the unknown future. If sharing these existential musings provoke an anxiety, I, I apologize and I offer this justification. Within such a context of heightened appreciation for the time we do have, I think we can more fully embrace 
the time we have together. Being with you in this moment, even through Zoom, is a celebration of the present. Being together in community, being present to each other in the now, affirms our mutual worth and dignity. It's a precious gift of time that we give to each other, and it transforms the mundane into the miraculous. When we invest time in a relationship, we honor each other with the most precious gift we have. In The Little Prince by Antoine de saint exupéry the prince falls in love with a little rose on a barren asteroid. He cares for the flower, which is defenseless and fragile. And the prince confronts the question of whether he's wasted his time, because though the rose eventually dies, a wise fox counsels the prince, it is the time you have wasted on your rose that makes your rose so important. In other words, time being with and caring for each other is never wasted. It's what adds the preciousness to life and heightens the importance of now. This emphasis on the present time affects my approach to ethics. I mean, during this pandemic, there have been times where I wanted to hit pause and just curl up and pull the sheets over my head. Generally, the present moment, however, has become even more important. While occasionally I think, tomorrow I'll try to make a difference and today I'm not going to, I do feel more called to make a difference today. Time in and of itself is neutral. It's up to us to use it now for good. And that was at the heart of a 1965 speech by Martin Luther King Jr. I wanna read a piece and I want you to listen to how he speaks of time and its relationship to the work of moral repair and building racial and social justice. Let nobody give you the impression that the problem of racial injustice will work itself out. Let nobody give you the impression that only time will solve the problem. That is a myth. And it is a myth because time is neutral. It can be either used constructively or destructively. You see, King believed that evil demands a response from people of good conscience. He condemned, quote, the appalling silence of indifference of the good people who sit around and say, wait on time. King concluded, quote, human progress never rolls in on the wheels of inevitability. It comes through the tireless efforts and the persistent work of dedicated individuals. Without this hard work, time becomes an ally of the primitive forces of social stagnation. So we must help time and realize that time is always right to do right. Ethical culture's appeal to deed before creed is not set in a time frame. It is ethical culture's constant recognition that there is no time other than the present. And it reminds us that we should treat today as if it's the only day we're gonna live. This is a high bar, I know that, and we're not always gonna live up to it, but we can aspire to it. We can be reminded by it and it can increase how we express faith in each other. I wanna conclude with some practical advice for staying grounded when our time seems to warp. Some of these hints you may make you feel more centered and it may help us all bring out our best. I'm gonna start with advice from Kathy Casada, who's a freelance writer focusing on health matters. She urges us to stay in the right amount of busy. I like that. She says, don't lurch from one day, one extreme to the other. Don't try to be super productive and then suddenly collapse back into a lethargic entropy. We need some activity because without 
activity of normal experience out in the world with other people, we don't get the surges of dopamine we need. You can't beat the pandemic by over-functioning. To find the mean between the extremes, set up a, a reasonable daily schedule to look forward to and to follow. Bomb Baker compares it to a musician who constructs rhythmy, rhythm, harmony, meter, which can make music out of the noise of your day. And such a schedule can offer the stimulation necessary to maintain mental health during a time of repressed social interaction. Second, make sure you experience some time with awe and wonder every day. It's important to experience beauty. Just get out in nature, listen to beautiful music. Just because you can't go to a museum necessarily, you can see art masterpieces online or close your eyes, turn up your stereo, dance with yourself, do what feeds you aesthetically and try to maintain a steady diet. Cultivating patience is obviously another hint for successful coping. Because remember, people who cultivate patience are less likely to be disappointed. They experience better moods and more gratitude and empathy. Try to put aside the absolutizing phrases like, it'll never be the same, or the pandemic will last forever. We don't really know that. So while you have to respect the realities of the pandemic, ride the wave of time. Know that this moment that you feel will not be what you feel in the hours and days and months and for years from now. All this shall pass. And add to these cognitive methods a regular practice, maybe of mindfulness. I mean, I know that meditation is not everybody's thing, but five minutes of breathing exercises every day, like those Susanna has brought us in the past morning programs, can do a lot. You can increase your resilience and contentment when you bring intentionality to your breaths and to your thoughts. At this time when we have so little control over our physical and social lives, increasing control over breathing and thoughts, even just for a moment, can give you a rest. And lastly, and most importantly in some ways, connect with others. Pick that mix that works best for you. Plan socially distant talks or walks or Zooms at a frequency that fits your personality. Send emails and letters to people that share personal news and ask folks to write back. Being more explicit about your relationships can increase the benefits of connection. We're social creatures denied our normal doses of social relationship. Don't let that be the end of your story. Use the time you have to water the rose that you want to grow. You'll find that such time is never wasted. Thank you for sharing your time with me this morning. Have a good day.